Hello and welcome to this Beyond Shakespeare first look exploring session. I am your guest host, Liza Graham. Come back, Rob. All is forgiven. Um, and we will be exploring The Play of Love by John Haywood, uh, the, uh, in which we all explore uh, pleasant questions of love. There are four characters, and uh, to read these four characters, we have a marvelous team of readers uh, in the room. Um, to, to read the first character, uh, the lover loved, uh, we have... Tom Helsby from Brighton. Excellent. As uh, character number two, the lover not loved. Rachel, actor on the East Coast. And I think we can all agree the East Coast is a very fine place. Uh, as character number three, neither lover nor loved, we have. I am Greg, and I'm definitely being miscast tonight. Well, uh, I, I'm, uh, I hope that your love situation is, is better than, than your characters. Uh, as <laughs> character number four, the woman beloved but not loving, we have... Lindsay Beecham, actor in Scotland. Marvellous. Uh, and uh, yes, the, uh, the story so far, uh, we, are, we are reading the second half of this play. Uh, the first half may be found on our YouTube channel. Um, and a f indeed a full audio, uh, full cast audio adaptation of this play may be found at uh, the Beyond Shakespeare audio boom and anywhere good podcasts are found, uh, as, as may uh, interviews with Greg Walker talking about John Haywood's uh, works and indeed many other works by John Haywood you may find read by uh, us and ours. So uh, the story so far is that we have two characters who uh, are competing to see who is most unhappy, and we have two more characters who are competing to see who is most happy. Uh, the lover not loved uh, thinks they are uh, in the most pain from unrequited love. The woman beloved but not loving uh, believes that uh, she is more unhappy, and they have argued for a bit uh, about how uh, how unhappy they both are, and then left to find an impartial third party to judge them. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we have had the entry of, of two characters who each believe they are very happy. Uh, the lover loved, who uh, talks about uh, the contentment to be found in a, a mutual relationship, and neither loving nor loved, uh, who talks about the happiness to be found in freedom and not having any affection to bring you down. Uh, we've just... Uh, then uh, for a while, neither loving nor loved, uh, who I take to be in some measure the clown of the piece, um, Greg, was, <laughs> well, sorry, uh, that, that wasn't a direction, that was a dig, um, <laughs> was, uh, uh, so he was left, uh, or they were left alone on stage uh, to talk about, um, the the fact that they'd despite neither loving nor being loved they'd been in a relationship but they were deceiving their partner and their partner was deceiving them but it was all right it was a it, it was a pleasant joke on both sides apparently uh which is uh which uh i suppose as long as everyone's a consenting adult is fine um and we are we are now uh, we will give you just the end of that speech before the lover loved entereth uh and uh greg in your own time uh perhaps from from about four lines up if you would and since my part now doth thus well appear be ye my partners now all of good cheer but silence every man upon a pane for master woodcock is now come again the lover loved entereth the old saying saith, he that seeketh shall find, which after long seeking, true, I have found, but for such a finding myself to bind, to such a seeking as I know, as I was now bound, I would rather seek to lose twenty pound. Howbeit I have sought so far to my pain, that at last I have found and brought twain. 
the lover not loved and love and loved not loving enter it are they a horseback nay they come afoot which thou might see here for this is a great mist by jays you and yet see i thou blind bold coot that one of those twain might ride if he list how Marry, for he leadeth a nag on his fist. Mistress, ye are welcome, and welcome ye be. Nay, welcome be ye, for we were here before you. Oh, oh, oh. And ye have been here before me before now, and now I am here before you, and now I am here behind ye. Now we be here, even both together, and now ye be we welcome, even both hither. Since now ye find me here, with courtesy I may bid you welcome hither, as I may say. But setting this aside, let us side that has set a broach, the matter wherefore ye hither approach, when in I have hoped that ye both will be good unto me, and especially ye, for I have a mind that every good face have ever was some pity of a poor man's case, being as mine is a matter so right, that the fool may judge it right at first sight. Sir, ye may, you, ye may well doubt how my wit will serve, but my will from right shall never swerve. No mine, and as he sue for help to me, like suit have I to sue for help to you. For as much need I, for as much need have I of help as you. I think well that, dear heart, but tell me how. The case is this. Ye twain seem in pleasure, and we twain in pain, which pain doth procure by comparison between him and me, as great a conflict, which of us twain be in greatest pain, as is between ye twain, which of you twain in most pleasure doth remain. Wherein we somewhat have here debated, and both, to tell truth, so greedily grated upon affection each to our own side, that in conclusion, we must needs provide some such as would and could be indifferent. And we both to stand unto that judgment. Whereupon for lack of a judge in this place, we sought many places. And yet in this case, no man could we meet that meddle will or can till time that we met with this gentleman whom in like errand, for like lack of aid, was driven to desire our judgment, he said. Forsooth, it is so, a promising plain, they twain between us twain giving judgments plain, we twain between them twain should judge right again. That promise to form I did not disdain, for touching right as I am a righteous man, I will give you as much right as I can. Nothing but right desire I you among. I willingly will neither give nor take wrong. Nay, in my conscience I think by this book, your conscience won't take nothing but cometh a crook. For as in conscience whatever ye do, ye nothing do but as ye would not... So, ye nothing do but as ye would rather be done to. O oh, hope of good end! O oh, Mary, mother! Mistress, one of us may now help another. But, sir, I pray you some matter declare, whereby I may know in what grief ye are. I am a lover not loved, which plain is daily not doleful, but my deadly pain. Ah, a lover not loved, have ye knit that not? Yea, forsooth. Forsooth ye be the more sod. Now, mistress, I heartily beseech ye, tell me what manner case your case may be. I am beloved, not loving, whereby I am not in pain, but in tormentry. Mm, is this your torment? Oh, God turn him to good. Nay, there is another man. One me has wooed as this man on another woman is. <laughs> okay, so... um. Uh, magical bells say uh, pause for discussion if you guys are cool with that we've because we've now had all of the characters reintroduce themselves to each other uh, and I find that an interesting point that um, the lover not loved and the woman beloved but not loving their problem is not each other uh, their problem is two other people who are off stage um, 
So, I don't, I don't know. Um, and uh, and and uh, Greg, neither loving nor beloved, seems to have taken on the role of master of ceremonies here. Uh, how 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 are you feeling, that? It's an interesting one. I think he's. <laughs> Yeah, I, he definitely feels like he's gathering together. I, I also feel like, you know, if you were going to stage it, you'd have them on little podiums <laughs> or carrying signs, because by this point, the audience is probably utterly confused. Um, <laughs> There's only four of them. How hard can it be? Yeah, but with names oh, like they've got, and I mean, for, the, for those who are at home, We've all been given numbers because otherwise it would become too darn difficult to work out who was speaking <laughs> and finding your part in this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's interesting. He's very, I know it's a different character to the one I played Tuesday, but he does seem to have that same, once you've found that real sort of almost rap rhythm to it, or her, I'm not sure actually which one I'm playing yet, um, there is that sense of something there and you can really play with it. So yeah, liking it. Yeah, the, the rhythm the rhythm is lovely. Lindsay, you look like you have a thought. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a thought. I've completely <laughs> lost my script and I'm trying to reopen it. So please come back okay. to me. <laughs> that, that, that counts as a thought. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the character you were playing last time, Greg, that um, seemed, uh, character. the character you are now seems to talk much more on a, a human level. Like there's... Uh, and, and seems to react more to other characters rather than saying, look, here are my flowers of rhetoric and here's why my argument is the soundest. Mm. Um, it does feel like we've walked out of a pageant and into an actual play the now. Because the, the, the first half was to stand forth, if that makes sense. It was it was a little stand forth and maybe a little serious. You're doing a great job of helping it be less serious. And you know, every Skywalker needs a solo. <laughs> um, and and Rachel, how how are you feeling at this time? <laughs> it's ah, uh, you are you are feeling silent. That is that that is okay. Um, and uh, so, so, sorry to to call on you out of the blue. Um, so yeah, we've. I think this has been a pretty good reintroduction to these characters. As as you say, the names can be a little confusing. So it's nice to have everyone introduce themselves twice. And we're about at the midpoint of the play. Uh, and um, and Greg has now heard everyone's situation, and. Um, uh, and is is ready to maybe start judging some things. We'll see. Uh, carry on whenever you wish, Greg. Just to check, it's you think them both mad, isn't it? That yeah. one. Cool. You think them both mad, and do I, Bayjay's you? So Motai Thrive would do that list to Mark. Shall perceive here a pretty piece of walk. <laughs> Let's just fool some lots in those parts to scanning. Loving, not loved. Love, not loving. Loving, than loving, yet not loving nor loved. Well, I'm going to do that again. You think they're both mad, and do I, by Jesu? And so might I thrive, but to that list to mark, shall perceive here a pretty piece of walk. Let us fall somewhat in those parts to scanning. Loving, not loved. Loved, not loving. Loved and loving, and not loved, nor loved. Mm. Will you see these four parts well joined? Hmm. Loving not loved and loved not loving, those parts can join in no manner reckoning. Loving and love, love nor lover, these parts in joining likewise differ. But in that ye love, ye twain join it be. Uh, here, neither loving, no, here, neither loving nor loved points to his co disputants, as the case may be. And being not loved, ye join with me. And being no lover with me, join is she. And being be loved with her, join ye. Had I had joined with me, join jointly, well, ye join us should join, join joint quickly to join quickly. I still got that long one. For first, I would these. Oh dear. Had I had joined with me, join jointly, we join us should join jointly to join quickly. For first, I would part these. Parts in sleazes, and once departed, these parted pieces. Part and part with part, I would so part like part that each part should part with quiet heart. And done. <laughs> Sir, since passeth your power that part to play, 
let pass and let us partly now essay to bring some part of that purpose to end for which all parties yet in vain attend. I do desire the same and that we twain may first be heard that I may know my pain. I grant for my part, my faith of my body, why, where the devil is the whoresome noddy. I never in justice, but evermore I used to be shriven a little before, and now, since that my confession is done, I will depart and take penance soon. When conscience pricketh, conscience must be searched by God, in discharging of conscience, or else God forbod, which maketh me met when conscience must come in place, to be a judge in every common case. But who may like me his advancement avaunt? Now am I a judge, and never was servant, which ye regard not much, but by aught that I see, by any reference that ye do to me. Nay, yet I praise women. Great men go by, they crouch to the ground, look where her they lie. <laughs> they should have a beck by St. Anthony. But alas, good mistress, I cry you mercy that you are unanswered. But ye may see, though two tales at once by two ears heard may be, yet cannot one mouth take two tales at once answer, which maketh you tarry but in your matter, since ye by haste in having furthest home would first be sped of that for which ye come. I grant, as he granted you will to fulfil, your you twain to be heard first begin when you will. As these twain, us twain, now grant first to break, since twain to be heard at once cannot speak, I now desire your grant that I may open first tale, which now is at point to be spoken, which I crave no with my part to avance, but with the pith to avoid circumstance. Speak what and when soever it please you, till reason with me I will not disease you. Sirs, either here is a very weak brain, or she hath, if any, a very weak pain, for I put case that my love I her gave, and that for my love her love I did crave, for which, though I daily sue day by day, what loss or pain to her if she say nay? Yes, by St. Mary, so the case may stand that some woman had leave her take in hand to ride your errand one hundredth mile than to say nay, one painter lost a while. If ye, on her part, any pain define, which is the more painful, her pain or mine? Hmm. Your pain is most if she say nay and take it, but if that she say nay and forsake it, then is her pain a greater way the greater. Sir, ye allege this nay in this matter, as though my denial, my suitor to love, were all or the most pain that to me doth move, wherein the truth is a contrary plain. For, though too oft speaking, one thing be a pain, yet is that one word the full of my hoping to bring his hoping to despair at ending. Thus is this nay, which ye take my most grief, though it be painful, yet my most relief. But my most pain is all another thing, which though ye forget or hide by dissimuling, I partly showed you, but all I could nor can. But masters, to you, with pain of this man, that pain that I compare is partly this. I am loved of one whom, the truth is, I cannot love. And so it is with me that from him in manner I can never, flee, I never can flee. And every one word in suit of his part nips through my ears and runs through my heart. His ghastful look so pale that an if I dare for mine ears cast toward him an eye. And when I do, that eye my thought presenteth straight to my heart. And thus my pain augmenteth. One tale so oft. Alas, 
and so importune, his exclamations, sometime on fortune, sometime on himself, sometime upon me. And for that thing, that if my death should be brought straight in place, except I were content to grant the same, yet could I not assent? And he, seeing this, yet ceaseth not to crave what death could be worse than this life that I have. This tale to purpose poor purporteth no more, but sight and hearing complaint of his sore is only the grief that ye do sustain. Alas, tender heart, since ye die in pain, this pain to perceive by sight and hearing, how could you live to know our pain by feeling? Mark well this question and answer as ye can. A man that is hanged or that man's hangman, which man of those twain suffereth most pain? He that is hanged. By the mass, it is so plain. Well said for me, for I am a sufferer, and ye the hangman understand, as it were, these cases vary in no matter a thing, saying, saving this serves in this man's hanging commonly is done against the hangman's will, and ye of delightful will your lover kill. Of delightful will, nay, that is not so as ye shall perfectly perceive ere we go. But of those at whose hanging have hangmen by, how many have ye known hang willingly? Nay, never one in his life by a lady. In this, lo, your case from our case doth vary. For ye that love, where love will take no place, your own will is your own leader. A plain case, and not only uncompelled without a lure, but saw against her will your suit ye endure. Now, since your will to love did you procure, and with that will ye put that will in your, and now that will by wit seeth love such pain as witty will would will love to refrain, and ye by will that love in each condition to extinct may be your own physician, except ye be a fool or would make me one. What saying could set a good ground to sit on to make any man think your pain thus strong, making your own salve your own sore thus long? Mistress, much part of this process purposed is matter of truth truly disclosed. My will without her will brought me in love, which will without her will doth make me hove upon her grace to see what grace will prove. But where ye say my will may me remove as well from her love as will brought me to it, that is false. My will cannot will to do it. My will as far therein outweighed my power as a sow of lead outweigheth a saffron flower. You will outweigh your power. Then where is your wit? I marvel that ever ye will speak it. Nay, marvel ye, mistress, there hath no wit. For, as, as this point may stretcheth in verdict, I am clearly of this man's opinion. And I contrary with this minion. Then be we come to a demure in law. Then be ye come from a woodcock to a door. And by God it is no small cunning brother for me to turn one wild fool to another. Nay, masters, I heartily pray you both banish contention till ye see how this goeth. I will repeat and answer her tale forthwith. The pith for your part whereof pretendeth, a proof for your pain to be more than mine, in that my will not only did me incline to the same, but in the same, by the same will, I willingly will to continue still. And as will brought me and keepeth in this bay, when I will, ye say, will will bring me away, concluding thereby that 
If my pain were as great as yours, that I should surely bear as great and good will to flee my love thus meant, as do ye your suitor's presence to absent. This tale showeth my tale perceived every day. Then for entry to answer it as well, answer this put case, ye as deeply now did love your lover as he doth love you, should not that loving, suppose ye, redress that pain which lack of loving doth possess? Yes. Since love given to him giveth yourself ease then, except ye love pain, why love ye not this man? Love him? Nay, as I said, must I straight choose to love him or else my head here to lose? I know well, I could not, my life to save, with loving will grant him my love to have. Okay, quick quick pause for discussion here, uh, if if that's cool. Um, yeah, this, this uh, disputation is bringing up all sorts of stuff. Lindsay, you're new to this play. How are, how are you finding it and how are you finding your character's situation? Yes, I mean, it's very, I think it's very interesting. It's, it's obviously ever so clever. And, um, but, you know, it's a huge amount of wordplay. And, oh God, it's, it's quite difficult to read. It's quite difficult to grasp the sense of what you're saying as you're saying it. Um, so, I mean, some plays are more difficult than others to sight read. Um, so I'm finding I'm, I'm, you know, sort of sometimes not exactly sure what I'm saying, but I'm, sort of hoping that if I do it with conviction, it'll read. <laughs> um, but I'm enjoying it. I mean, it seems to me, I, I was lurking in the in the session on Tuesday, and it seems to me that it's now become slightly more dynamic because all four characters are on stage and, and the, sort of the debate has been struck, as it were, so. Yeah. Uh, th thoughts from the room about uh, where where we are now with this. It it seems to me that um, it it seems to me that that uh, we've had we we've had Lindsay's character put forth her, uh, her argument as to why she is in greatest pain, um, and it really seems as though the others do not understand her situation that it's not simply it's not simply that she doesn't love her suitor it's that she can't get away from him she is essentially being stalked and uh the the way that the others react uh to her seems to me to echo uh the response from from people to for example online harassment or or real world stalking it's like oh someone loves you why is that a problem well it's a problem because they're obsessed with with me and I can't get rid of them. Um, uh, Rachel, do I do I do I hear do I? Um, it, it's okay. It's okay. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay. Yeah, just to, just to oh god, this has completely escaped my brain. The point, <laughs> the point I was about to make. Um, following on from what you were saying about, uh, so, oh, yeah, it's very interesting, this argument about the use of will, like, you know, she's accusing, she's accusing too of basically saying, well, you had the will to love that person, you know, so you can have the will to not love that person. And two is saying, well, it's not as simple as that. So what part does will play in love? Oh yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. You know, uh, I I suppose um, the in in a way uh, the lover not loved is is pleading diminished responsibility in a way, saying you know I wasn't in control of my actions. My my will was a saffron flower, and this feeling was a a, a bar of lead, and, and it, it outweighed me. Um, but uh, on the in in the but on the on the other hand of uh, the uh, character number two the uh, the lover not loved is um, saying that uh, nothing makes them as happy as their lady's presence and so they they seek out their lady's presence every day 
and uh, that doesn't sound healthy. You know, you can't choose what you feel, but you can choose what you do. <laughs> um, it, I, I mean, it's odd to look at this this period drama with a 21st century person's eye of, Tom, Tom, save us. <laughs> it's too late. Um, yeah, in, in a way that could sort of like echo lockdown. I know so many people who've been locked in with their loved ones. Um, and normally they would go out to work and they would be a part uh, and I suppose in this time in history, the world was very small. You didn't have a, a huge um, circle of friends or the, the uh, possibility of, of getting away from people. I mean, it's a small town, big hell type of thing. You're locked in together and... Um, and as I say, it's very reminiscent of lockdown in, in the sense that I know lots of people who are stuck with the uh, nearest and dearest. And uh, it's a strange situation. But in those days, you weren't you didn't uh, you didn't have the potential to to travel about and um, be in society, that big a pool of society, I think. It's it's true, and unmarried women, especially, were um, uh, if they were especially were not necessarily free to to travel alone or to decide where they went, um, or women not yet married, assuming that they had uh, you know a parent. Uh, Rachel. No, uh, yeah. To what Tom said, the idea of. Um, uh, what we find socially acceptable or personally acceptable and how close uh, we are to people, not just physically, but then how how much like in terms of time being spent with each other that uh, people can get a, a sense of, um, you know, you need to give me that personal space and that this personal space is not being, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, respected. I mean, the big revolutions were, well, not the big revolutions, but a big, a revolution, a big revolution was the, the, the bicycle. I know I'm jumping forward in time, but, or the first class mail, because it meant that women could actually travel and talk to other women, which was absolutely scandalous. You know, it's like, God's sake, don't let them get them talking to each other. <laughs> yes. Although it's, it's important to note that in the early modern period, um, uh, th there are tons of poems about um, not necessarily upper class women, but but sit but uh, working working class women. Uh, there are tons of poems about them being gossips and going to each other's houses and talking to each other and um, oh my gosh, doing that instead of keeping house for their husbands. And um, you know, if someone if someone was in labor, if someone was. Uh, you know, if someone was having their child christened, it was basically an excuse for the entire neighborhood to go over to their house. Um, so th there, there, we, um, in in a sense, uh, perhaps. And again, uh, if any of the historians were here, if if Helen uh, or Tracy or Angela were here, they might set me right on this. But it seems to me that the higher status, uh, the higher social status, a woman was perhaps the less freedom she had. Uh, if she was, uh, assuming she's young, not yet married for the first time, uh, widows had a little more freedom. Um, wives, it was kind of a lottery. Uh, but but if, you're, if you're not yet married and under the control of a parent or guardian, uh, then uh, if, you're, if you're upper class, you might even have a little less freedom. Um, but uh, again, you know, I'm perfectly uh, likely to be wrong on this as much. But I do like your point, Tom, about about lockdown, about it testing people's respect for each other's space when they have that much less space, that it's still important to create your own space, even if you have le less space than you used to. And even if you're with someone that you uh, 
who you're accustomed to sharing space with, that it does test people's endurance uh, for relationships <laughs> as well as for solitude. Uh, yes. So, okay, uh, Lin Lindsay's character, loved not loving, has, has, has made their case that um, they are in torment because the person who purports to love to to love her will not leave her alone and so, and the others have asked well in that case if if you loving him would make him happy and it would make and perhaps it would make him bother you why don't you just love him and uh uh lindsay do you have any thoughts on, on how your character reacts to that question being asked um, I mean, it's it's one of the one of the more direct uh, speeches in here. You know what? You love him. You know, I I I I could could just as soon love him as lose my head. You know, I couldn't love him to save my life. Yeah, would would literally, you know, if a headsman with a big axe were standing right there and being like, "Will you date this guy?" Like, um, no. Nope. <laughs> uh, I think we need one of those when we stage this. Yes. Number five. Definitely. Yeah, Axeman. <laughs> um, Scylla Black with a giant axe. <laughs> or, or whoever hosts the dating game in the, in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, uh, but that also reminds me in some ways of, of how, um, especially women, but sometimes also, also, uh, also men, uh, of the reaction that people who are being stalked get. It's like, you know, people oh, I'm sorry, you know, this guy is bothering you with, his, with you know, but they treat it as a sort of lover's tiff rather than as non-consensual harassment, which, which it is. So, um, if, if you, uh, if you, Lindsay, would do your, your last speech once more from love him, if you would, that, that I think, uh, I, I, th I don't think that's too much of a jump back uh and, and it would sort of set us up uh for the next for the next bit if you're cool with that love him nay as i said must i straight choose to love him or else my head here to lose i know well i could not my life to save with loving will grant him my love to have I think ye speak truly, for will will not be forced in love, wherefore the same to ye. Since this is to you such difficulty, why not a thing as difficult to me to will the let of love, where my where will my love hath set, as you to will to set love, where will is your let? Well said and put, cause it as hard now be for you to will to love her, as for me to love him. Yet have ye above me a mean to learn you at length to will to leave love clean, which mean many thousands of lovers have brought from right fervent loving to love right naught, which long and oft approved mean is absence, whereto when ye will, ye may have license which I crave and wish and cannot obtain, for he will never my presence refrain. This is a medicine like as ye would will me for a thing to cure me, the thing that would kill me. For presence of her, though I seld when may have, is solely the medicine that my life doth save. Her absence can I with as ill will will, as I can will to leave to love her still. Thus is this will brought in incidentally no aid in your purpose worth tale of a fly. And as concerning our principal matter, all that ye lay may be laid even a water. I wonder that shame suffereth you to compare with my pain, since ye are driven to declare that all your pain is but sight and hearing of him that, as I do, dieth in pain feeling. O oh, pain upon pain, what pains I sustain. No craft of the devil can express all my pain in this body, no limb, joint, sinew, nor vein, but martyreth each other and this brain, chief enemy of all, by the inventing, mine unsavory suit to her discontenting, my speaking, my hearing, my looking, my thinking, in sitting, in standing, in waking, or winking, whatever I do, or wherever I go, my brain and mishap and all these do me woe. 
As for my senses, each one of all five, wondereth as it can to feel itself alive, and then hath love gotten all in one bed, himself and his servants to lodge in his head, vain hope, despair, dread, and audacity, haste, waste, lust, without liking or liberty, diligence, humility, trust, and jealousy, desire, patience, sufferance, and constancy, these with other in his head, like swarms of bees, sting and debating their contrarieties, the venom whereof from this head distilleth down to this breast, and this heart it killeth, all times and all places of this body, by this distemperance thus distempered am I, shivering in cold, and yet in heat I die, drowned in moisture, parched, parchment dry. Cold, hot, moist, dry, all in all places at once. Marry, sir, this is an ague for the nonce, but all we give judgment I must search to view whether this evidence be false or true. Nay, stand still. Your part shall prove never the worse. No, by saying saviour, here is a wet arse, lets me feel your nose. Nay, fear not, man, be bold. Well, though this arse be warm and this nose cold, yet these twain by attorney brought in one place, are, as he saith, cold and wet, both in like case. Oh, what pain drowns him. See how his dry lips smack for more moisture of his warm, moist hips. Breathe out, these eyes are dull, but this nose is quicker. Here is most moisture, your breath smelleth of liquor. Well, since ye have opened in this tale, telling the full of your pain, for speed to ending, I shall in few words such one question disclose, as if your answer give cause to suppose the whole of the same to be answered at full. We need no judgment, for yield myself, I will. Put case. This man loved a woman, such one who were in his liking the thing alone, but that his love to her were not so mickle, but her fancy toward him were as little, and that she hid herself so day and night that seld time when he might come in her sight. And then put case, that one to you love did bear, a woman that other so ugly were that each kiss of her mouth called you to Jib's feast or that your fancy abhorred her so at least that her presence were as sweet to suppose as one should present. Oh, turn to his nose. Yay, in good faith. Where to the case is this, that her spiteful presence absent never is. Of these two cases, if chance should drive you to choose one, which would you choose? Tell truth now. <laughs> what you study tarry you be too greedy men be not like women always ready in good sooth to tell truth of these cases twain which case is the worst is to me uncertain first case of these twain i put for your part and by the last case appeareth mine own smart if they proceed with this first case of ours, then is our matter undoubtedly yours. And if judgment pass with this last case in fine, then is the matter assuredly mine. Since by these cases our parts so do seem, that which is most painful yourself cannot deem. If ye will now, if ye now will, all circumstance eschew, make this question in these cases our issue and the pain of these men to abbreviate, set all our other matter as frustrate. Agreed. Then, further to abridge your pain, since this our issue appeareth thus plain, as folk not doubting your conscience nor cunning, we shall in the same let pass all reasoning, yielding to your judgment the whole of my part. And I, likewise, Mine with will and good heart. Oh, so low. Make you know, 
curtsy to me now, and straight I will make as low curtsy to you. Nay, stand near, sorry, stand, bleh, nay, stand ye near the upper end, I pray ye, for neither end is good enough for me. Your cases, which include your grief, each which are dwell in this head. And in mine, but yet, all that worth herein our judgments publish, I shall desire to that we twain may finish as far as in our matter toward judgment, and ye have done in yours, to the intent that we, our parts brought together thither, may come to judgments, throw hence together. By a lady, sir. Okay, uh, ma magic bells say, let's pause for discussion a bit, because we had, uh, we've, na we've had four's testimony now, we've, ha we've had uh, the testimony of character number two, uh, loving, not loved. Um, so, yeah, we've, um, and, we, and we've had what seems to be uh, an early modern sort of physical examination uh, by our neither loving nor loved character, uh, to see whether uh, to see uh, how 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 character uh, how the lover not loved's uh, health in fact is whether whether love has affected their physical health as much as they say. Um, Greg, was it fun doing that? Muted though. Uh, no, not at all. No, I mean I. This is one of the joys of not reading ahead. You just suddenly, <laughs> a speech like that utterly jumps out at you and you're just like, what the? I, I, yeah. I, it, I could just see that it was going to, it will be, it would be an absolute gem for some physical comedy. And actually you could almost do it out of context as a party piece because it is just so utterly disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but the quacks uniform I mean it was pure that sort of um, you know the, the whole Tudor quack coming out it was great loved it um, and it's really nicely formed and again the, the sentence structure in this it still amazes me because it catches you occasionally but it also works to your advantage because you can really play with the wording yeah. yeah, God, I don't have to learn these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Haywood must be a bit of a bear to memorize uh, one one feels. Um, and also, I, I love the sort of image of the, you know, I, I sort of imagine the, the lover not, not loved because that was such a character type in drama. I, I imagine them as this, you know, this young, young person, uh, Dress, dressed well but disorderly in this sort of lyric poetic way and, and suddenly there's this clown going okay uh but let me feel your butt <laughs> and, and now let me put my hand on your nose Ew. <laughs> so um, we have the first point in the play where the text explicitly says that one character touches another which is also significant um Especially for our times, where you know we we have to all keep social distance from each other, and um, Rachel, as Carrie, as as the lover not loved, um, did did you feel like you were sustaining your your argument in this bit? Uh, I don't I don't know. Um... Uh, I, 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 I don't I don't know. I haven't I, I really don't have any thoughts at the moment for the this this piece. Um the spe the speeches are fun to do. I I I, I don't know what Yeah. Yes, I'm I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I, I, I you know uh I should I should let things flow a bit a bit more naturally. Um and it will be interesting to hear what our two judgmental characters say about it uh uh lindsay's character also has has uh has drawn some co very valid comparisons uh saying you know if you're if you're the lover you can choose to be absent from your beloved but but lindsay's suitor never gives her that choice so so consent is is 
an important thing here. Uh, thank you. Um, other thoughts from the room, or let's, or shall we, shall we forge ahead in 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 the devil's name? Um, oh, okay. Uh, mm. uh, Tom, would you mind giving us? Uh, uh, Tom, would you mind giving us that mm. last speech once more, just so we can start the section? And in mine, but yet. Yes, oh. and certainly, and in mine, but yet. Or that we hear, herein our judgments publish. I shall desire you that we twain may finish as far as in our matter towards judgment as ye have done in yours, to the intent that we, our parts brought together thither, may come to judgment throw thence together. I am lady, sir, and I desire the same. I would ye began. Begin then, in God's name. Shall I begin? Since I but look for winning, give me the end and take you the beginning. Who shall win the end? The end at the end shall try. For my part, whereof now thus began I, I am, as I said, a beloved lover, and he who, and he no lover nor beloved another in which two cases he maketh his avaunt, of both our parts to prove his most pleasant. But be assured, be aught I yet see, in, this, in, in his estate no manner pleasure can be. Yes, two manner pleasures ye must needs confess. First I have the pleasure of quietness, and the second is I am contented. The second pleasure, now secondly invented, to compare with pleasure by concentration, is a very good second imagination. Then show your wit for proof of, si of this in hand, how may pleasure without contentation stand? Pleasure without contentation cannot be, but contentation without pleasure we see in things innumerable every day. All, of all which mark these which I shall now lay, but case that I, for pleasure of some friend or something which I long to see at end, would be content to ride three score mile this night, and never would bait nor never light, I might be right well contented to do this, and yet in this doing no pleasure there is. Moreover, be ye by patient sufferance may be contented with any mischance. The loss of your child, friend, or anything that in this world you can, can, can be longing, wherein ye contented never so well, yet in your contention pleasure to tell. These two examples by all that I see be nothing of the things that anything touch me. With death of my child being contented, or pain with my friend willingly assented, is not contentation voluntary. For that contentation cometh forcibly, but my con contentation standeth in such thing as e I would first wish if it went by washing. Sir, be you contented, even as ye tell, yet your contentation can neither excel nor being compared equal to mine estate, for touching contentation I am in I am in rate, as highly contended to love as ye see, as ye to forbear love can wish to be. Had I no more to say in this argument, but that I am, as well as you, content, yet hath my part now good ap approbation to match with yours even by contentation but contentation is not all that all the thing that i for my love have in recompensing above contentation pleasures feeling have i so many that no right living can by any wit or tongue the same report Oh, the pleasant pleasures of our resort. After my being from here any whither, what pleasures have we in coming together? Each tap on the ground toward me with her doth bath in delight my very heart root. 
Every twink of her alluring eye foot reviveth my spirits even thoroughly. Each word of her mouth, not a preparative, but the right medicine of preservative. Be so jocund and joyfully joined, her love to my love so currently coined, that all pleasures earthly the truth declare, and our pleasures not able with ours to compare. This mouth in manner receiveth no food. Love is the feeding that doth his body good, and his head despaireth all things, all these eyes winking. Longer that love doth keep in his heart, thinking to dream of my sweetheart. Love is my feeder, love is my lord, and love my leader of all mine affairs in thought, word, and deed. Love is the Christ cross that must be my speed. By this I perceive well, ye may correct me, that love is a goodly and a good thing. Love good, what ill in love canst thou speak, make thou appear? Yes. I shall prove this love at this time meant here, in this man's case, as ill as is the devil, and in your case I shall prove love more evil. What tormentry could all the devils in hell devise to his pain that he doth not tell? What pain bringeth that body these devils in that head, which ministers always by love are led? He freezeth in fire. He drowneth in drought. Each part of his body love have brought about, where each to help each other should be diligent, they martyr at each other the man to torment, that no fiend may torment man in hell more. <laughs> Without stint of rage his pains be so sore, as in your case, to prove that love is worse than the devil, my meaning is this, love distempereth him by torment in pain, and love distempereth you as far in joy play. Your own confession declareth that ye eat, drink, or sleep, even as little as he. And he that lacketh in any of those three, be it joy or by pain clear, ye see, death must be sequel, however it be. And thus are ye both brought by love's induction, by pain or by joy, to the like point of destruction. <clears throat> Which point to prove his love, in this case past, beyond the devil in tormentry to have a cast? For I trow ye find not that the devil can find to torment man in hell by any pleasant mind. Whereby, as I said, I say of love still, of the devil and love, love is the more ill. And at the beginning, I must say to you, if God had seen as much as I say now, love had been Lucifer. And doubt ye no wit, but experience now have taught God such wit, that if aught come at Lucifer other than good, to whip souls on the breach, love shall be the blood. And sure ye is one that cannot live long, for aged folk ye what well cannot be strong. Another thing that this physician doth guess, that he is in fact with the black jaundice. No further than... Ye be infected with folly, for in all these words no word I can I espy, such as for your part any proof advouch vouchsafe. For proof of my part, no, but it toucheth this to proof of yours. For where you alleged your part above mine to be compared. By pleasures in which your displeasures are such that ye eat, drink, nor sleep, or most not much. In lack whereof my tale proveth plainly, each part of your pleasure is a ugh, tormentry. Whereby your good love I have proved so evil that love is apparently worse than the devil. Oh, and as touching my part, there can arise no man of displeasures nor tormentries in that I love not, nor am I am not loved. I move no displeasures, nor none to be moved, but all displeasures of love from me absent, by absence whereof I am quietly content. So where uh, ye said, and think ye have said well, that my joy by love shall bringeth 
death in sequel. In that by the same, in manner, I disdain food and sleep, this proverb answered you plain. Look not on the meat, but look on the man. Now look ye on me and say what ye can. Oh, nay, for a time love may puff up a thing, but lacking food and sleep, death is the ending. Well, sir, till such time as death approve it, this part of your tale may asleep every whit. And were ye by absent displeasure would match with my present pleasure, ye seem more bold than wise, for those twain be far different, sure. Is not absence of displeasure a pleasure? Yes, in like rate as a post is pleased, which as by no means it can be diseased, but displeasure present, so it is true, that no pleasure present it can, in it can assue. Pleasure or displeasure, feeling sensibility, a post, you know well, cannot feel possibly. And as a post, in this case, I take you concerning the effect of pleasure in hand now, for any feeling ye in pleasure endure more than ye say ye feel in displeasure. Sir, though the effect of your pleasure present be more pleasant than displeasure absent, yet how compare ye with mine absent pain by present displeasures in which ye remain? My present displeasures, I know none such. Know ye no pain by love, little nor much? No. Then shall I show such a thing in this purse, and surely shall show her in your path the worst. <sighs> he looks in his purse. Now I pray God the devil in hell blind me. By the mass I have left my book behind me. Oh, I beseech our Lord I never go hence if I would not have rather have spent forty pence. But since it is thus I must go fetch it. I will not tarry you, sir. The devil stretch it. Farewell, Dorcock. Farewell, and, Dorcock. And he is uh, gone. our clown has exited. Uh, our ni neither loving nor loved uh, has, has exited uh, just as he was about to produce from his purse the definitive thing that would prove uh, that he was happier than the lover loved. And um, yes, we've we've had two characters. So we've had two characters argue about who's in most pain. Uh, and then the other characters have said, okay, but before we judge you, you have to then judge us, uh, who is the most happy. So uh, to me, the argument about who's in most pleasure feels like it ran a little shorter. Perhaps, perhaps it's a little harder to do to argue who's happiest rather than who's least happy. Uh, um, and There's a wonderful, um, you know, is, is pleasure the um, the ceasing of suffering type of thing? Uh, displeasure and pleasure. Is pleasure just the absence of displeasure or is displeasure? Yeah. So for my part, I, sometimes the, uh, the most halcyon times is when the pain stops type of thing. Um, so that that taking away of pain is uh, is a pure pleasure, uh, more than any contrived pleasure. It's it's true, and and uh, Greg's character asks you, uh, "Aren't you in pain from love at all? The from the love that you're in, um, know ye no pain by love, little nor much?" <laughs> and and you give him the answer that can't be refuted. It's like, mm -hmm. nope, doesn't hurt at all. Thanks. <laughs> So I guess if you're in love and love doesn't hurt you, have you won? <laughs> I, I, I think he's, he or she is just too much in love, blindly. Um, I like a good cynic myself. <laughs> well, cynics are sexy. There's no, there's no denying it. But would you rather be in love? And, would you rather be blind but happy or, or open-eyed but, but painful? Open-eyed and painful, definitely. 
<laughs> well, uh, yeah, there, there are... Well, I'm, I'm talking to, to, to dramatists, aren't we? I mean... It's, it's true. Perhaps pain is a little more interesting to write about. I don't know. Thoughts from the room? I'm spitballing here. <laughs> well... I, I suppose blind happiness always runs the risk that honesty will eventually rear its ugly head. <laughs> Rachel. I don't know. Is this one of his earlier ones? Um, or, or, I don't know if it's one of his earlier ones or not, but it's so different from... Um, uh, uh, maybe I'm mistaken because there's also that other Haywood that... Um, because uh, we're doing one of his plays in the morning and we did the, I think the golden age uh, as well. And um, they're so very different from this play, at, at least so far. I mean, we're only, I think a couple pages from the end, but um, uh, what do you call it? The It's so based on argument, like, um, and I think that joy, like a, the joyful part of love, uh, it doesn't create as much argument uh, and maybe the personality or demeanor of um, somebody who's happy is not as likely to argue as uh, these other people who are arguing their pain or their suffering because they want to argue because they're uh, miserable. It's kind of like um, how anger isn't, a, anger isn't a first emotion. It's like a secondary emotion that comes out of sadness or pain or other things. Yeah, yeah, that, um, you know, if happiness always contains the potential for sadness, so I guess, Greg, maybe, maybe one of your character's arguments is that it would be easier to make Tom's character unhappy than yours. <laughs> um. He feels like, he almost feels like sort of that um, cynic stroke. Uh, sort of person I'm not going to name the play but ranting in the cave against all humanity <laughs> that he, he, he's not well at the moment he's not going to change it's interesting I hadn't well even when I read, had a very quick skim I hadn't read a, I hadn't quite caught the fact that um, three is the vice and now everything else makes sense in the play Yes, the the author waits waits to refer to him as the vice uh, until that stage direction. So uh, yes. so uh, as vices do, you you kind of snuck up on us. Uh, uh, yes, sorry, Stephen, I nicked your part tonight. <laughs> well, that's what vices do, you know. Yeah. Typecast <laughs> again. <laughs> um, but but it's weird that the vice should be the absence of love. Um. Yeah, he should, to me, he should be the one who frequents the brothels, and maybe he does. We haven't just uh, found out yet. So, but... Maybe so. I mean, that first speech that Angela did on, on Tuesday made it clear that the absence of love is not the absence of sex. Um, I... You know, you can still pretend to be in love with someone, uh, if that's your jam. Uh, but, but uh, oh, it's important, by the way, to note that... Uh, this after the afternoon sessions play the golden age uh, which will be available on our youtube channel um is is by thomas haywood rather than john haywood uh thomas haywood was a later playwright and it's really easy to get them mixed up i'm pretty sure i called john uh thomas a couple times on uh on tuesday um so many haywoods why couldn't they be considerate of us and call themselves something else we'll never know um <laughs> but but this play dates from about 1533. Lindsay. Okay, so I missed that whole thing. And I was thinking, this is really weird for Thomas Haywood. I mean, this is really weird. But, you know, <laughs> they write develop, they go through phases, they start here and they end there. So who am I to judge? Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rachel. 
No, it, I think we're doing John Haywood in the morning this time. Not we're not doing the Golden Age right now. We did the, I, I mixed up the Golden Age, and I I knew I was making up mixing up some of these Haywoods, but I do think the if you know not me is oh that's Thomas. John, it is Thomas. John. I I don't even know who any of them are. Why am I? I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> it's all it's them. okay. I had to check we, Wikipedia as as well. Um, if you know not me, you know nobody. Um. I actually don't know, chap, which Haywood that is. Uh, no, it appears it appears that it is Thomas. Yes, it is. Well, according to Rob's emails, it is. So I'm going by Rob's. <laughs> well, it's kind of ironic for this playwright who has the same name as another playwright to write a play called "If You Know Not Me, You Know Nobody." Um, that bit bit of like branding branding exercise there, uh, but uh, but yes, uh, if you know not me, you know nobody will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, in the also Battle of the Haywoods, you can, you can compare them and figure out what your favorite is. Uh, <laughs> I think we all know who our favorite cat is, uh, and it's definitely Rachel's cat. Um, so, uh, Greg, what do you think was in your character's purse that you looked for and couldn't find? Well, it seemed to suggest it was a book. To me, anyway. Mm. Um, obviously not the Karma Sutra, but the... Um... <laughs> Um, uh, the Tudor equivalent. Maybe it was a book of cures. I mean, who knows? After, after him discussing various. I, I mean, he was, it was very interesting with that line. Uh, what was it? He's got the black, um, not sanguine, um, color, black bile. Uh, yes, Melancholy. the line of just before I shut up. Flam. <laughs> No, it wasn't phlegm. I can't find it now. Bile is usually black, but yeah, there there are two flavors of bile: yellow bile, <laughs> which is which is collar, uh, anger, and black bile, which is melancholy and makes you sad. No, uh, I, can't, I actually now can't find it. Um, Lin Lindsay, um, it's black jaundice. In jaundice that was oh. yeah. Black but jaundice. I reckon he was looking for a book of cures for various ailments ah, a physician's book because you were you were also acting the physician with rachel's character um it's but... interesting he seems to be very separate i love the fact that he just lets everyone argue for a while no. and then sort of pops up and says well come on then number three uh one sort yourself out Yes, yes, he's 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 trolling. I think very successfully uh, the, these very very serious characters, and, and the black jaundice is interesting. Of course, jaundice, as we all know, turns you yellow. It's a, um, I think, a kidney kidney ailment uh, or liver liver ailment. Um, but then, uh, so so perhaps black jaundice is is melancholy uh, by another by another name, black bile rather than yellow bile, as they understood it. Um, so uh yes um so you you are uh you are gone now greg for for a moment uh you will make a rather spectacular re-entrance in a bit uh but first the other characters must say farewell to you uh so tom in your own time is this from nay the um gone yeah no this night he oh, uh, will i think it's from from farewell dawcock if you would and, and ah. Greg, you do have one more line. Right. Mm -hmm. Farewell, Dorcock. Yeah, farewell, Woodcock. He is gone. Gone? Yea, but he will come again and on. Nay, this night he will no more disease you. Give judgment heartily, even when it please you. Which done, seeth. He is gone. Myself straight shall righteously between you give judgment final. But Lord, what a face this fool hath set, he set here, till shame defaced his folly so clear, that shame hath shamefully in sight of you all, with shame driven hence to his shameful fall. Wherein, Although I naught gain by winning, that aught may argument my pleasure in loving. Yet shall I win thereby a pleasure to see that ye shall see the matter pass with me, that through the prophet may light be loaden, it 
give grievous a man to be so to be overtrodden. Nay, when I saw this winning must grow, this by pain pretending in my part to show, then whilst wist I well the noddy may come to do as he did or stand and play mum, no man, no woman, no child in this place, but I durst for judgment trust in this case, all doubt of my pain by his proof by any mean, his running away hath now scraped out clean. Wherefore, give judgment, I shall return in place there hereby where my dear heart doth sojourn. And after salutation between us, pad such as meet to make us to make lovers' heart glad. I shall to rejoice here in merry tidings, declare the whole rabble of this fool's lijings. Here the vice cometh in, running suddenly about the place among the audience, with a high fropper tank on his head full of squibs fired, crying, Water, water, fire, 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 water, 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 fire, water, fire, until the fire in the squibs be spent. Water and fire? Water for fire, I mean. Well, thank be to God, it is out now clean. How came it there? Sir, as I was going to fetch my book for which was my departing, the chances in my warehouse... Oh, Greg, you're I... a little faint. Well, I... if, if we can have just from the beginning of that section, once more if you're happy. Sir, as I was going to fetch my book, for which was my departing, there chanced in my way a house hereby to fire which is burned piteously. But marvellously the people do moan, for a woman, they say, a goodly one, a sojourner whom in this house burned is, and shouting at the people for help in this, may be run thither to have done some good, and at a window thereof, as I stood, I thrust in my head, and even to flush, fire flashed in my face, and so took my bush. What house? house painted with red ochre the owner whereof they say is a broker then break my heart alas where why live i this day my dear heart is destroyed life and wealth away oh what man sit down and be of good cheer <laughs> god's master Sorry, God's body, Master Woodcock, is gone clear. Oh, Master Woodcock, fair mot befall ye. Oh, right, Master Woodcock, I must now call ye. Master, stand you here afore and rub him, and I will stand here behind and dub him. <laughs> Nay, the child is asleep, he need not rock. Master Woodcock, Master Wood, 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 Woodcock. My folk be far within a man must knock. Is not this bang drowning behind the rock? <laughs> Speak, Master Woodcock. Speak, parrot, I pray ye. My leman, your lady, I will ye see. My lady, your leman, one undertakes to be safe from fire by slipping through a jakes. That word I heard, but ye I see her not. No more do I, Master Woodcock, our Lord, what? Unto that house where I did see her, I, sh I will speak to her. And if she be past, so that to appear there I cannot make her, then will I burn after an o'ertake her. Okay, okay, we have to pause there because... Oh my God, something actually happened in this play besides talking. Um, first of all, a dude came in with firecrackers on his head, which, uh, you know, I, I applaud that. If you're, if you're having a play about philosophical arguments, absolutely having a dude come in with his head on fire is, is the, 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 best, the best way to resolve that argument. And, and uh, yeah, Tom, he told you your house burnt down and your spouse is deceased. And, and that's a... That's a bit dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> we didn't see that one coming, no. But there again, love gets their upcomings for being so smug. <laughs> 
one, all, all people who are happy in love deserve for their spouse to die just to, that's kind of harsh. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a good test. <laughs> yeah, it's a test no one wants to have to take. I, I'm sure I'm sure Greg would Greg might say it's what you deserve, but but none of the rest of us would, and then Greg tries to console you in a really weird way. Um Greg, what do you think you're you're doing to that character there? I'm lost. I just love that entrance. But then again, <laughs> and I might be misreading this. Um because it's not the first time I've gone lost on a tech. Um, <laughs> I, I almost thought he suggested she escaped. My yeah. lady, your lead would want to yeah. take safe from fire by slipping through a Jake's. Yes, yeah, um, think... a, and a, a Jake's was a toilet, so it would have a hole in the floor. Uh, so it wouldn't be the best way to save yourself from the fire by like going through the hole in the outhouse, but uh, if it's that or burned to death, I mean, fine. Um, he, uh, so we, we don't know, we don't know whether character one's spouse is okay and just a bit stinky or uh, flambéed to death. Um, but uh, but he's gone to find out. He's gone to, to uh, and said that if he that if she's if she's passed away, he'll burn with her. Um, and and now uh, and now Greg has something to say. Uh, please please take it away, Greg. I'm, after I'm just gonna say I feel like I've walked out of a um, Sartre plane to a carry on. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit of a gear change right there. <laughs> from from a high-minded philosophical rhetorical dispute play into sod it let's just have some shit explode um, it's like they oh, switched directors midway through the film <laughs> anyway i shall try and do this next one it's, it's well, like, yes go for it the lover loved goeth out well, ye may burn together for all this and do but enough for all to yet that is amiss for god's sake one run after him, based him. It were great pity the fire should waste him. For me, that ye have knowledge must record a woodcock well roast is a dish for our lord. And for a woodcock, ye all must know him by matter of record that so doth show him. And briefly to bring you all out of doubt, all this have I feigned to bring about. <laughs> himself to convince himself even by act as he have done here in doing this fact oh uh, he'd take his more thought for this one woman now than all than could i for all in the world i make a vow <laughs> oh which have so shamefully disfaced his part that to return another have he face nor heart which see whilst he and she lose time in kissing give ye with me judgment of god's blessing the lover loved returneth the proof of my saying at my first entry that wretched that wretch bringeth now in place in that i lied dissembling man's mind by appearance to be thing, thing inconvenient which thing, as I, as I said, I, is proved now true. How was I dismayed by his false facing the death of my darling, whom I thank God is in health and ailing nothing? Oh, sir, I beseech you, of all your dismay, whatever cause can ye lay than your loving? My loving? Nay, all the causes was your lying. Oh, what had my lie done if ye had not loved? What did my love till your lie was moved? By these two questions, it seemeth we may make your love and my lie to part evenly the stake. Oh, loving and lying have we brought now hither, lovers and liars to labour together. <laughs> oh, but put case my lie, if a death were true, what excuse for your love could then ensue? In fortune, God save her, did bring her to it. The fault were in fortune and in love no wit. The whole part fault in fortune? But by my sheath, well, ye, God send your fortune better than your wit. 
Well, sir, at extremity I can prove the fault in fortune as much as in love. In fortune, in like case with love, now join you and I with loving, join in lying even now. And well they may join all by all that I see, for each of all three I take it like vanity. But, sirs, ye confess that your part of such pain cometh half by love, and that is certain, that certain pains the loved lovers do move, in which the fault in nothing save only love, as dread and jealousy each of him. Which with mode to your estate of love is a daily foe, and I clear out of love, declaring such show as in my case no pain to me can grow. I say this consider a pith sufficient in proof of my part to drive you to judgment. Nay, first a few words, sir, though I confess that love bringeth some pain, and your case painless, by mean of your contented quietness. Yet the actual pleasures that I possess as far above the case that ye profess. And in my pain in your imagination under the pleasures of constentation. Thus weighed now how ye will one way or the other. If ye win one way ye shall lose the other. But if ye intended for end to be brief, join with me herein for indifferent pre Proof, a tree ye know well, a thing that hath life, and such a thing has never feeleth pain, nor but ever quiet and always contented. To bring a tree displeasure by feeling pain, so no feeling pleasure in that can remain. A horse is a thing that hath also hath life also, and he by feeling feeleth both wealth and woe. By driving or drawing all day in the mire, many painful journeys hath he in hire. But after all those he hath all way at night, these pleasures following to his good delight. First fair washed at a river or a weir, and straight brought to a stable warm and fair, dry rubbed and chafed from head to heel, and curried till he be slick as an eel. Then he is littered in a manner nose high, and hay as much as will in his belly, then provideth here, hath he, either peas, beans, or bread, which feeding in feeling as pleasant to his head as to a confused man to be, to be behold, of his own Westminster Hall full of gold, after which feeding he sleepeth in quiet rest during such time as his meat may might digest. And all his considered a horse or a tree, if ye must choose the one, which would ye be? When the horse must labor by our lady, I had liefer be a tree than a horse, I. But how, when he is resteth and filleth his gorge, then would I be a horse and no tree by St. George. But what if ye must need stick to one? Which were then best by the mass. I can name none. The first case is yours, the next is for me. In case like a tree I might, I may liketh ye. For as a tree hath life without feeling, whereby it feeleth pleasure nor displeasing, and cannot be but contented quietly. Even like the case is yours now presently, and as the horse feeleth pain and not the tree, likewise I have pain and no pain hath ye. And as a horse above a tree feeleth pleasure, so I feel pleasure above you in rate sure. As, and as the tree feeleth another and the horse both, even so pleasure and pain between us twain goeth, since these two cases so indifferently fall that your judgment can judge neither nor for partial. For indifferent to end, I think this best way of all your reasoning to debar the rest. And in these two cases, this one question to be the issue that we shall join on. Be it so. Now, 
are these issues couched so nigh that both sides, I trust, shall take end shortly? I hope and desire the same, and since we were first heard, we both humbly beseech ye that we in likewise may have judgment first. I grant. By the mass, and I come best or worst. Though nature force man stiffly to incline to his part in each particular thing, yet reason would mean when man shall determine another man's parts by indifferent, or indifferent awarding, indifferent to be it all his reasoning. Wherefore, in, his, in this part cut we off affection, so that indifferently be our direction. Contented with that, and by aught I espy, we may in this matter take end quickly. Scan we their cases, as she did apply them, that we may perceive what is meant by them. He loveth and loved a goodly one, she is loved not loving an ugly one, or in his eye his lover seemeth goodly, and in her eye a low but lover seemeth as ugly. Her most desired angel's face he cannot see, his most lutely hell's hound's face she cannot flee. He loveth, she abhorreth, whereby presence is his love, her death, whereby, I say, even this, be his feelings pain in every degree, as great and as many as he sift they be, yet in my judgment by these cases hath she as great and what many pains as she. What matter of full is, is in differently laid, as ye in this judgment have laid this now. What reason the time by me should be delayed? Ye have spoken my thought. Wherefore, to know, in pleasing your pains, my conscience doth allow, I just counterpoise, and thus your pains be, a judged by us twain, one pain in degree. Well, since your conscience driveth you thus to judge, I receive this judgment without grief or grudge. And I, in like rate, yielding unto you twain, hearty thanks for this, your undeserved pain. Now, mistress, may it please you to declare as touching their parts of what mind ye are? With right good will, sir, and sure, I suppose their parts in few words may come to point well. The two examples which he did disclose, all errors or doubts do clearly expel. The estate of a tree, his estate doth tell, and of the horse, his tale well understand, declareth as well his case now in hand. For as nothing can please or displease a tree, by any pleasure or displeasure feeling, nor never bring a tree discontent to be, so like case to him, not loved or loving. Love can no way bring pleasing or displeasing. Live women, die women, sink women or swim, in all the content, for all is one to him. And as a horse hath many painful journeys, a lover best loved, hath pains in likewise, as here hath appeared by sundry ways, which showeth his case in worst part to arise. Then, as the horse feedeth pleasure in size at night in the stable above the tree, so feeleth he some pleasure as far above ye. In some case he feeleth much more pleasure than ye, and in some case he feeleth even as much less. Between the more and the less, it seemeth to me that between their pleasures no choice is to guess. Wherefore, I give judgment in short process, set the one pleasure even to the other. Womanly spoken, mistress, by the rude mother. Who heareth this tale with indifferent mind, and seeth of these twain, each one so fully bent to his own part that neither in heart can find to change pleasures with other must need assent that she in these words hath given right judgment 
and affirmance whereof I judge and award both these pleasures of yours as one in regard. Well, since I think ye both without corruption, I shall move no matter of interruption. Nor I. But mistress, though I say naught in this, may I not think my pleasure more than his? Affection unbridled may make us all think that each of us hath done other wrong, but where reason taketh place it cannot sink, since cause to be partial here is none us among. That one head that would think his own wit so strong that on his judges he might judgment devise, what judge in so judging could judge him wise? Well, mine estate right welleth contenteth me. And I with mine as well content as ye. So would ye both likewise be contented, each other to see content in such degree, as on our parts our judgment hath awarded, your neighbour in pleasure like yourself to be, gladly to wish Christ's precept, both bind ye, Thus contentation should always prefer one man to joy the pleasure of another. True, and contention may be like, may be in like case. Although, although no health yet help and great relief in both your pains, for ye having such grace to be contented in sufferance of grief shall by contentation avoid such mischief, such as the contrary shall surely bring you pain to pain as painful as your pain is now. Thus, not we four, but all the world besides knowing himself or another in joy or pain, hath need of contentation for a guide. Having joy or pain content, let us remain in joy or pain of other. Flee me disdain, be we content, wealth or woe, and each for each other rejoice in the one and pity the other. Since such contentation may hardly accord, in such kind of love as here hath been meant, let us seek the love of that loving Lord, who to suffer passion for love was content, whereby his lovers that love for love is sent, shall have in fine above contentation the feeling pleasure of eternal salvation, which Lord of Lords, whose joyful and blessed birth is now remembered by time presenting this accustomed time of honest mirth, that Lord we beseech in most humble meaning that it may please him by merciful hearing the state of this audience long to endure in mirth, health, and wealth to grant his pleasure. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and thus yeah. ends, ends the play. Uh, after, after all of that debating, it was a tie. We, ha we, have, a <laughs> we have a draw. We're, we're sharing the gold medal four ways. <laughs> 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 it was a, a hard play to read straight off the bat um yeah because also you were left dumb for a long periods of time while the other while the other two two and four and one and three seemed to have all the, the banter between them and so you were sitting you know reading along but Without exercise, it was quite difficult to jump back in, and, and especially the length of the speeches as well. But um, first reading wasn't bad. Yeah, Haywood is an absolute, John Haywood, that is, is an absolute beast to read cold. Um, but at the, on the other hand, I do think that because the, 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 the text rewards preparation, that there is fun to be had from it, uh, in this play, you have to actively create the fun. The fun isn't necessarily uh, always, always present on the page. 
Unless um, there are fireworks involved. <laughs> yeah, Rachel. I think the trouble with reading this cold also is he writes so differently than um, so many other people. The um, there's so much uh, reference to internal and uh, internal stuff, but I have no idea where these people are in space. Like, I don't know what the setting of this is. Um, and like, if the language, I mean, the language is modern, but like if, uh, you know, it was written in prose or something in the way that writers write now, I still wouldn't know if it was, you know, if somebody just deleted the spacing and took out the messed with the timing i wouldn't know if this was written modernly or, or or back then you know like um i don't i don't mean it like uh what i mean is that's how how much i don't understand the setting that he's not uh that i'm not picking up i don't know if he set it up or not but i'm just not picking it up yeah that's a really important question of of where are we he he doesn't specify and uh, perhaps that was deliberate. Maybe he wrote. He, maybe he was thinking this play could be performed anywhere. Uh, the, at some point, uh, Greg talks about uh, uh, neither loving nor loved. Talks about uh, being off stage and seeing someone else's house burn down. So we're in a town. We're near some people's houses. Maybe that's that's all I got. Uh, so so yeah that feels weird and as you say that feels as though it could be very modern because they're in an undefined space so you could set it on the international space station or or uh lindsay lindsay yeah or you could set it in a in a kind of tudor maze or you Ooh. could set it in um a kind of peter brookian you know geometric swing shapes you know that that kind of action you know which he's, he famously did. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do with it. Um, I think some cuts might might be worth thinking about, um, possibly as well. Some of the speeches are quite long and quite convoluted. Um, so, in terms of a dramatic presentation, that might that might be one way forward as well. I, I like the uh, International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> I like that because. It, it felt like like I am presented here like a floating head <laughs> of just sort of like ver verbal verbalizing um, constantly, which which is is good once you can get your once you can get into it and start tumbling with it. But um, as I say, for, from not having anything to do to jump straight in to having then long periods where. You didn't have anything to do then to jump straight in was it's it's uh, it takes some takes some uh, a different skill set than than when you you you're constantly um, working between each other. Tom, I promise there are easier texts out there. <laughs> <laughs> You've definitely had a baptism by fire. <laughs> you gave me Cornelia the other the other day, and now this. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I really struggled with the text until the first night, and I, I read it entirely by, just by rote almost. And tonight, once I got the idea, I was the judge of the case. It was easier, and I started getting my way in. As soon as I spotted that stage direction, the vice re-enters. It made so much sense of three, mm. and mm. and I still can't get over. I mean, those has to be that speech about the um, <sighs> the medical stuff, and his re-entrance, and then the speech about the fire have to be some of my favourite moments I think I've ever done in this group. It's like. I, we've got to do the second look just to work out how to get a fire, a load of fireworks on the guy's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, 
as long as we get to cast you in that part and just put yes, a bunch so of explosives so well on, your, on your head. <laughs> hey, I'll play anything in this. <laughs> I'd also, I think, about, and I was thinking about this the other day, I think it would be interesting to play it, because actually, though it is gendered in some ways, I, 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 it's been very interesting playing it, first of all, on Monday, uh, sorry, Tuesday with a very female heavy room, which was lovely, and it was great hearing it, and I, I just don't think it matters what gender plays what gender. It, it, it feels very... What's the word? A gender, if that makes sense. Yeah. In, in the cast list, the only character whose gender is specified is uh, is, is uh, Lindsay's character, a woman uh, beloved but not loving. Uh, of course, we can, um, you know, when, when we cast, we can also cast that as we please. Uh, the, the other three are not specified in the text, but are, I, I assume that, Hay, that Haywood assumes them to be male, which, you know, I, I know I said this uh, last session, but, you know, does lover automatically mean man? Is is a woman never the lover? Is a woman always the beloved? Is is that, you know, can can women not love? Can we not choose? Can we not suffer? Uh, yeah, it always puts the female in the passive position there, passive role, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, but you know, I do like the idea of of playing around with genders of casting, seeing what that does to people's sympathies uh, with the characters, and or to the characters' relationship with each other or with their offstage partners if they have them, uh, or even to the vice, whomever they may be. Uh, you you know, um, we we know that in this period, in any case, gender of actor and gender of character don't have to match. Uh, so there's that too. You know, who. What genders are the characters? What genders are the actors? Uh, what genders are any of us? Um, yes. Yeah, as long as the script is good. Yeah, yeah. Just you know how how do gender and romantic love and 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 its perception uh, interplay, which is really interesting uh, interesting way to think about it. It probably goes goes back. Uh, to Plato's uh, Symposium, where Plato draws that distinction between lover and beloved, uh, but half the characters in the Symposium are talking about relationships between men, um, and they and they always speak of the beloved as, as it were, the weaker party. Um, or the younger. Or the younger, or the younger. Um, so uh, anyway, read the Symposium, it's awesome. It's just way more fun than the Republic. Um, <laughs> so so yeah i guess maybe it is time to go around the room for final thoughts and the magic fickle finger of fate lands on Lindsay first if that's okay yes that's fine i mean um i yeah i think i probably maybe sort of partly already said it before which was about um you know, wondering about ways of staging it and uh, and possibly cutting it to to make it a bit more a bit more dynamic uh, rather than recitative, whatever that word is. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it really. It's kind of um, yeah, I, I sense it's more clever than 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 good in a way. Um, and, and, you know, I, I quite like cleverness, but I, I'm just not sure, I'm not sure if I was watching this as, a, as an audience. I mean, the firework moment would be awesome. And it's a great kind of, you know, you know, it's a great thing when the vice sort of says, oh, you know, I've just been out there and there's a big house on fire and there was a woman in there. Funnily, she looked like your wife who's dead, burnt to a crisp. I mean, all of that is kind of like quite good, but but I didn't really feel the rest of the play had that, had that kind of impact. And so I think if I was watching it as a member of the audience, I might well feel shortchanged of any real substance. Um, and I just would be kind of overwhelmed with cleverness. So I'm not sure that it would be for me as an audience member, certainly. Yeah, with with the wordplay, I guess you'd have to internalize it as a language that these characters just speak. 
Hmm. Um, and uh, the vice speak is a little bit less flowery and a little bit less wordplay, um, although sometimes he's more so. Um, but but uh, I suppose a direction to give to to keep it from being too too much like a philosophical debate is just to direct everyone to want what they want times a hundred, to to really up those stakes and to and to see anyone questioning you as a as a threat to to your happiness. Um, so so I I don't know. Um, one one thing I wonder is whether. The lover not loved. Uh, Ra Rachel's character has has learned anything. Has this been sort of a group therapy session for them? Will it will it help them move on? <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, and it's interesting that. Sorry, I know you're moving to Rachel, but just as one more final point is that the writer does give to number two the kind of you know religious homily at the end. You know, so. Like the only way out of this pain is to, you know, surrender to Christ, kind of thing. Well, there, there's that, but I was, um, I was surprised that there wasn't more religious stuff throughout the play. That there wasn't more discussion of, for example, sin, um, or or what have you. I mean, we have a vice; we don't have much virtue. Uh, there, um, but. Yes, what one thing that epilogue does do, of course, is establish that this is a Christmas play. And I suppose if you were performing this play not at Christmas, you would just leave the epilogue out. Um, so, uh, Ra Rachel, final thoughts? No, I've just been making all sorts of faces because everything about the... I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling this play uh, currently. Um, it's not just that they're the long speeches, these long almost monologues back and forth at each other uh, or to each other or something like that, but it's that so much of what they're saying because it's internal is self-referential. So like if you're physicalizing that, you're pointing to yourself and you're, you're talking about this or that and you're moving. I, I don't see like there's a lot of directionality in um, the language, which I'm, used to from some of uh the plays from this period now that they're telling you a, a you know a certain pattern of movement or a certain um place to hit in the you know the stages that they would have of the time or to look at address certain members of the audience or go for something like that um i, I don't know yeah the i don't know why he put that on character number two i i've reading him today I didn't expect that to come out but also there was none of that language before and then all of a sudden the talk of precepts which is everybody in this room's <laughs> most favorite word <laughs> the glass of government available on our YouTube channel yeah that's just uh this was just the I don't know it's just so uh so the weirdest play that I think uh I, I've been in for a reading for with you guys. There's just something about it that there's the pacing or the direction of it that just the structure of it throws me off. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, Haywood loves uh, Haywood loves his debate plays. He loves plays where people argue about who is the, the soundest. Um, and so we end up with this play where everyone's got very cerebral terms for this feeling that is love a cerebral thing you know is yeah, for, for and and try is trying to re impose rules of of rhetoric and logic on on this emotion that we may or may not all have felt at some point uh and which is not a logical feeling generally often sometimes um i'm spitballing here uh, uh tom final thoughts at all um well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy there was no religious connotations in them. Being a happy pagan, uh, I would have spat. <laughs> um, I would have had an electrical fault somewhere. Um, Fireworks on your head. That's it. <laughs> but, uh, and also, uh, I mean, forgive me, I, I wasn't here for the first uh, half. So when I joined, I sort of like said, well, what's the characters like? And it, 
they're not very clear. There's a lot of words. There's a lot of um, too clever by half. Um, and yeah, it could do with a lot of editing, I think, in the sense of making the characters clearer and, and more defined and um, not just not just Babel. Um, but it, yeah, it a, as I say, a good first reading, I suppose, if there's ever such a thing. It's it's like the first pancake. It might come out a funny shape, but if it still tastes okay, you're fine. Just put lots of maple syrup on that mofo and and just, yeah. just you know, um, that that's that's uh, we're talking about American style pancakes here, friends. The the fluffy kind, bit sort of crispy on the bottom, very fluffy inside. Pancakes. I'd really like some pancakes. Anyway, Greg, final thoughts. <laughs> I was just I was wondering, certainly some cuts would be good um i was also wondering if you could somehow have a little bit of a play around of positions of cut some of the conversations up and almost try and not have them so much one and three then two and four and maybe a mm. little bit more into cut I, i'm just still recovering from certain <laughs> parts of that play <laughs> <laughs> my head is feeling a little hot now um no it's Ooh, you're, yes uh are we are we supposed to feel your arse at this point uh, uh, yeah that 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 too yeah <laughs> possibly um yeah i've done a couple of haywards now and i'm i'm not sure it's the weirdest play we've ever done i think i think it's um i think it's possibly up there with that um, certain John Bale ones win, I, be I believe, on the weirdness. But, you know, hey. Um, but, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad, I'm glad I was here both parts this week. I'd have liked to have read the same part all the way through, because I think it would have actually helped. It's just unfortunate the way that we... Um, the way the casting worked out, we had to change parts. Yeah, it, it, I agree that it would be interesting and maybe it would help the readers, the re those readers who were in both sessions, uh, have more of a handle on, on or a through line on what's going on. Um, yeah, it would, be, it would be an interesting task to try and cut this play for performance. Um, you'd, I guess, it, I mean, dramaturgy, dramaturgy, always read it all, understand it all thoroughly, understand the structure. Um, because, yeah, Greg, you're, you're right, sometimes it's a bit like an Olympic racket, uh, an Olympic bracket in that two characters argue, and then two more characters argue, and then the winner of that argument fights the winner of this argument, and uh, then someone's head explodes. And um, so, so I guess to, to cut this play for performance, you'd have to work out which, which bits which things that characters say do another character respond to? Which which things which things that get said make other characters react or feel things? Um, one and I would absolutely keep those two moments of embodiment, which is the the mock, which are both uh, both the vice, uh, the, the the mock medical exam of of the lover not loved, and also um, when. Uh, when the lover who is loved thinks that their house is burnt down, uh, the vice also has that wonderful speech right saying, you know, okay, everyone, uh, group hug, group hug, and, and like, what's what's he doing there? Is he, is he, you know, is he patting him? Is he is he holding him so he can't escape? Is he wiping his face with his gross, dirty handkerchief? What's he what's he doing? Um, you know, uh, obviously it's 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 very stage worthy to torture uh torture the poor bereaved character as much as possible in that, before you realize, realize that they're not in fact bereaved and it was haha it was all a joke for the lols uh and and because somehow winning the argument justifies making you think your spouse has died yeah. <laughs> yes. um, it's just not cricket you see not not cricket at at all um even if you escape through a toilet uh which if there were no toilet humor this wouldn't be an early modern play um 
So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, interesting first look. It would be easy to see more. Uh, uh, Tom, did you have did you have more thoughts? Was that a hand I saw? No, I I just have to uh, I have to go. So. Okay, um, <laughs> as as do we all. So thank you so much to our wonderful readers and farewell. Here is a wet arse. <laughs> <laughs>